Harim has waved his magic finger at me, which means that it is time to start the show. You are listening to Disclosure. My name is Sean Boonstra. Today on the program, we are going to look at a man that some people have called the Leonardo da Vinci of Scandinavia. And this really is, I promise you, this is going to be one of the strangest stories you will ever hear. But... I'm going to keep you in suspense because before we get to this story, I'm going to acknowledge that I am not alone in studio. I am here with my wife, the lovely and talented Jean Boonstra, who also happens to be responsible for a phenomenal faith-based radio drama for kids known as Discovery Mountain. And I know I ask you about this every time you come into mm-hmm. studio, but what's new on Discovery Mountain? Well, um, glad to be back with you, Sean. And you had you know, no choice. We're married. <laughs> you had to come in. I could get no other guest, uh, and I forced you in here. Is that is that a, I'm your default? If you you're get my no other default guests. guest on the show. That's oh, right. No, we have fun when we're in here. But um, tonight, in fact, when we're finished recording this program, um, we are going to begin recording for Discovery Mountain. We do that four to five times a year, and wow. so when we do Discovery Mountain production, it's it's intense. They're very long days. Twelve you, hour days. Wait a minute. Days. Wait a minute. You, you record it intense. In, in, no, it's intense. Oh, intense. Yeah, we don't record intense. We record. Well, I was in this just wondering. Studio. We have this lovely studio. It's perfectly good. Why would you record intense? Right. Right. I guess unless we wanted the right. ambiance of a tent, but no. I want everyone to know that Gene put me up to that pun before the show. Yeah, definitely did not. Yeah. I'm not going to take the blame <laughs> for that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, so um, you are not intense, but you no, are intense. We are. It's intense production. Oh, okay. Uh, and we're we're going to be recording starting tonight a season that has the title "In the Beginning." So wait a minute. I'm getting Any my guesses own, here? I'm getting my own supper, right? You're get, if you're nah. doing this tonight. No, you're you're doing a part for me tonight. Don't forget about that. Wait a minute. I'm that. always going to go home after the show today. No, 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 no. You're Chaplain Simon in Discovery Mountain. No, wait a minute. You killed lines. Chaplain Simon out of the show. No, he just went overseas. He's not dead. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so don't leave when the don't show's over today. Don't leave when we're done okay, today. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so we do that but, tonight. Uh, Apparently, yeah. I will be recording. You will be. I am the voice mm-hmm. of Chaplain Simon. Yes, you I'll see if I can get a suave. Is he suave? Oh. Uh, I don't know if he's suave, but if you want to make a, his character suave, He's not a why weenie, not? though, right? Is he, is no. he a weenie? No, no, he's an army chaplain, so he's oh. he's he knows what he's doing. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. I'm in control. Yes. Well, yeah. I'll take that part. Okay. Okay. Yeah, in the beginning. Any guesses on what the Bible story is? I'm going to go with creation. In the I'm going to go yes. with creation. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about dinosaurs. No kidding. Dinosaurs and the creation story, and I'm really looking forward to I've it. I've been told by the younger set that I am a dinosaur, so I could probably pick up another <laughs> role here. Yeah, not that kind of dinosaur. Actual dinosaurs. Okay. Mm-hmm. The kind that provide petroleum. There you go. Yeah. That's right. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm Chaplain Simon and the Dinosaur, episode number one. Yes. Is it a big Mm -hmm. part? Do I have a big part? Do I ride a dinosaur? You do not. No. Uh. No dinosaurs actually appear in the season because we don't want to scare any of the younger kids with dinosaur sounds. Uh, But we're still going to have a ton of fun talking about learning about dinosaurs. All right. Lots of dinosaur bones. What is your best dinosaur sound? I do not have I want a to, We cannot go on sound. to our topic today until you no, do a dinosaur sound. No, this is not happening. No. Oh, no, I want to hear a no, dinosaur no, no, no. sound. I don't have a dinosaur sound. It's that sound. or you do your seagull impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> you do a pretty good seagull. I'm not doing either. I'll do my chicken. Okay, you do the If chicken. you do your dinosaur. No, I don't have a dinosaur. We have daughters. They weren't into dinosaurs. They were very uh, typical. That's true. Mm-hmm. All right, you don't get a chicken until I get a seagull. Okay. okay. I'll, pe- I'll pest you after the next break. I'm a, I do a really good chicken. You know I do a good chicken. Okay, do your chicken. No, no, not until I get the seagull. No, I'm not doing this. All right, then it's time to get on to our subject for today. But just Imagine before we, that. yeah, just before we do that, I mean, and we're going to look at hands down one of the most interesting people in European history. Mm-hmm. This is somebody everybody's been influenced by, but you've never heard of him. I promise that. But before that, I want to show you a fascinating science story that was making the rounds just a few weeks ago. Gene, I know it's a bit of a strange question, but growing up, did you have a favorite planet? Hmm. Probably not. Not even Earth? No. Well, yeah, if not I had even to Earth. pick one, it would be Earth. <laughs> right. Definitely. If you had said Pluto, then I could ride your case about the fact that it's no longer. It's yeah. Or have they re-promoted you know, it to I'm, planet again? I don't think so, but it's it's sort of very, Poor it changes Pluto. all the time. Poor, Poor Pluto. Pluto. Demoted. I well, I did have a favorite planet. Mm-hmm. You'd be surprised to learn. No, I'm not surprised really? to learn. Really? Yeah. That I had a favorite planet in no. elementary school. Saturn. <laughs> Because of the rings, right? Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. That's not the only planet with rings. 
Uh, all the gas giants have rings. Jupiter has rings. Mm -hmm. Neptune and uh, mm -hmm. Neptune and uh, I'll say Uranus. Uranus. Yeah, Uranus mm -hmm. also have rings. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most obvious rings, the spectacular ones, the ones that you can see with a modest telescope, Saturn. Right. But alas, and here comes the bad news. Okay. Alas, the rings of Saturn are disappearing before our very eyes. Hmm. I read this story the other day. New findings from NASA indicate that the planet's gravity is pulling the rings apart because they're mostly dust and ice. Hmm. The gravity of the planet is pulling the rings apart, and the pieces are all falling down to the surface of the planet. Hmm. And before too long, the rings will be gone. So our grandchildren potentially may learn of Saturn without rings. With, That's well, interesting. Yeah. Well, according to the estimates, we don't have a problem here because it's going to take another 100 million years to pull all the pieces <laughs> oh, down. Oh, okay. And so, you know, I got all so worked up about the story. Oh, no, my grandchildren will never see the rings of Saturn. <laughs> right. No, nope, no, nope, unless they live 100 million years. I don't okay. think that, yeah, you'll still be able to show them to your great-grandkids. I'll there be you gone go. by then. You'll be around still for the great-grandkids. No, I'll be a tombstone. So. Pretty much statistically, I'm going to go first. I hope. Statistically, I hope because, like, if you're not around, like, how am I going to run my life without you? <laughs> Who's going to find my keys? I I've talked to the girls. If anything happens to me, they're in charge of you. We already have a plan. Oh, Don't no. worry, they'll take no, care. No, no, no. Our youngest has said that I get a cot in her garage <laughs> and a litter box. No, she'll be nicer <laughs> to you than that. <laughs> All right. Oh, dear. Well, Sean, you did pique my interest at the top of the show. Who is this mysterious man from history that we're going to look at today? Well, this is a story that started for me back when you and I lived in northern British Columbia. Mm, oh, so many ago. years ago. Yeah, like 40 years ago for me and two for you because you're not old enough to have been 40 years anywhere, right? Uh, I wish. I was out for my morning walk one day and I stumbled across a tiny little church I had never heard of. It was mm. called the Church of the New Jerusalem. And of course, being in the religion profession myself, I was immediately curious, who is this church? Who are mm -hmm. the Church of the New Jerusalem? I'd never met them at the ministerial association in the community. Uh, as far as I know, uh, these people didn't belong to any Christian denomination that I had ever heard of. Hmm. Did you figure it out? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this is what led me on one of the most fascinating studies I've ever done on one of the most fascinating characters in European history. The Church of the New Jerusalem is a denomination in its own right. It's a tiny one. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'd be more accurate at this stage in development to call it a sect because while they do fall well outside the boundaries of what you and I would consider Orthodox Christianity, okay. they're the devotees of a man by the name of Emanuel Swedenborg who lived back in the 17th and 18th centuries. Hmm. Well, that's not a name that has the same household familiarity as, say, Luther or Calvin, is No, it? exactly. No, yeah. no. Most people haven't. And and yet I was surprised to find out that even though most of us have never heard of Emanuel Swedenborg, he proves to be one of the most influential people to come out of the Enlightenment period. Hmm. You and I may have never heard of this guy, but there was a time when he was a household name. Everybody did know him. Okay. And not that long ago. Hmm. Interesting. Well, why don't you take us back to the beginning of that story then? That makes then. good sense. Okay. Sure. Emanuel Swedenborg was born Emanuel Swedberg. Swedberg. I don't, I don't know if okay. I'm... Actually, I don't know if I'm Swedberg, pronouncing that correctly. Maybe? Swedberg? Well, it's spelled Swedberg. Swed... Yeah. I, who knows? Okay, he was born in 1688 with a different name. Mm -hmm. His last name was later changed to Swedenborg when his family was given noble status by the Swedish king. Interesting. So his dad was Jesper Swedberg. Mm -hmm. Swedberg. He's a Lutheran pastor in Stockholm, and it turns out that his little boy Emanuel is an academic wizard. Oh, he's a this, smart kid. Yeah. This kid, after graduating from Uppsala University in 1709, and I should probably point out he started university at the age of 11. Wow. Yeah. No, this is a bright kid. Yeah, that math adds right. up. Wow. But after graduating in 1709, he does a little bit of traveling, and he manages to rub elbows with some really big names, including... Uh, the famous British astronomers John Flamsteed and Edmund Halley, as mm, in Halley's Comet. Halley's yeah. Comet. There's also some speculation he may have actually met with Sir Isaac Newton at some point as well, uh, because he was very outspoken in his determination. I have to meet uh, Sir Isaac Newton. He rubbed elbows with some of the biggest scientific names of the period in the 18th century, the 1700s. Mm -hmm. We don't know if he ever did meet Sir Isaac Newton, but he sure wanted to. Hmm. 
So would it be safe to assume then that he started his his career as a scientist? Yeah, exactly. Right mm-hmm. During his travels around Europe, here's this kid. He starts university at age 11. 11. Wow. I know, just like me. I was 11. <laughs> you were 11. What was I doing Plus at 11? a few years. I was probably starting the sixth grade at 11, I think. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, and then I repeated that 14 times till they kicked me up for not shaving. And then... <laughs> But this kid started university at at 11. You started university at 17. I did start yeah. university at 17. Mm-hmm. Right. I turned 18 a few weeks later. It's not that spectacular. <laughs> no. Well, he's traveling around Europe, and as he does, he manages to master all kinds of disciplines. This guy is a, gen, a genuine renaissance. I don't want to say renaissance man. I guess he'd be a renaissance boy. Yeah. I mean, he's pretty mm-hmm. young. Young man. Yeah. So he becomes a master of a number of subjects just traveling around Europe. Hmm. He masters astronomy mathematics, botany, geology. I mm. mean, it, the, the number of sciences this kid picks up are wow. amazing. He even he even manages to become an expert lens grinder because <laughs> he goes to the Netherlands where the, te- the, not the telescope, the microscope had been invented by Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so they're in the business of grinding, li- gr- grinding lenses. <laughs> grinding, grinding lenses? Thank you. Yeah, grinding lenses. Uh-huh. And, um, and so he learns to do that. I mean, this kid's huh. good at everything he touches. And as his mind is expanding, he starts to dream up inventions. Hmm. Um, and at one point, he writes home. He writes his brother a letter describing more than a dozen of his inventions. And in those inventions, this is fascinating. This is like the beginning of the 1700s. Okay. A flying machine, hmm. kind of like Leonardo da Vinci, it, you know, sort it, of had it a is proto-helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. He designed a submarine. Now we're talking the 1709s to whatever, the decade after that. Sure. A machine gun. Hmm. He designs a machine gun that can shoot 10,000 rounds an hour, which is wow. pretty good. I don't know what that is per minute, but an automated gun. So, hmm. you know, of course, every time someone gets interested in science, they'll eventually find a way to uh, invent something. All of our best inventions, terrible to say, came out of war. You know, they yeah. really did. Even some of our medical inventions came out of World War mm-hmm. I. So he designs a... Um, a machine gun and a whole bunch of innovations, and this is an important part of the story, that could be used in the mining industry. And mining was really, really big back home in Sweden. Mm. So eventually he goes back to Sweden in 1716. There's our time frame. Mm-hmm. And the king was so impressed with his abilities. Oh, he started university at 11. Oh, like he's just still a kid he's at this very point. Young. Yeah. yeah. The king is so impressed that he gives Swedenborg a very prestigious post on the Swedish board of mines. Mm, and that's okay. a big deal. Okay. Now, that should have been the end of the story, mm-hmm. right? A Scandinavian Renaissance man who rivaled the brilliance of da Vinci. But his scientific studies opened up this huge can of worms. Because there was this attitude in the early days of the Enlightenment that if everything has a scientific explanation, then maybe religious and spiritual things also have a scientific explanation. So Mm. he started taking some of these scientific principles and tried to explain the spiritual world with that. I hear the music, so I'm going to leave it hanging there. What did he try to explain in the spiritual world with science? Uh, We're talking about Emanuel Swedenborg. I'm in studio with my wife, Jean. It sounds like like they just have a way in the control room of telling me when it's time to shut up. They just start the music <laughs> it's and it's over. Power. Yeah. So grab a pen and paper. You're going to want to take down this information from the good people at The Voice of Prophecy uh, because they have a phenomenal offer for you. And then Gene and I will be right back with the strange case of Emanuel Swedenborg. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers in guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions.
All right, Harim pointed at me again. It means I'm allowed to talk again. The mic's mm-hmm. back. They actually turn the mic off on us when they're tired of it. They just turn them off. They turn it off during the break. Do they turn yours off? Yes. Okay, good. Not it's not just, just mine. You guys don't no. just turn my mic off. <laughs> Uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, that's where we were before the right. break, a Scandinavian scientist, Sweden, appointed by the king to the Board of Mines. Absolutely brilliant, but then the story takes a change. It's a very ordinary story, other than the fact that he was, like, in college when he was 11 and he was brilliant and mm-hmm. knew Sir Edmund Halley and, you know. He, cool stuff. Yeah, he's, he's pretty mm-hmm. brilliant. But what happens is, well, he taps into this idea, and and a lot of things came out of the Enlightenment period that are with us to this day. One of those things is, well, if everything can be explained with logic, if everything can be explained with empirical data, Mm -hmm. then then religious things should be explainable, too. Mm -hmm. We should do a show on that sometime. That's actually what was behind the spiritualistic movement in America in the 19th century, was this idea, well, we should be able to crack the code of what happens beyond death, by using scientific methods, too. These weren't just parlor games to some of these people. They were actually trying to determine um, ways to speak to the dead scientifically, to the point where Edison, at one point, filed a patent for a machine to talk to the dead. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. That'd be another show. So Mm -hmm. Swedenborg's kind of tapping into that tradition, or he begins it, really. And as he's um, working on all kinds of valuable scientific texts, they're still out there. His books on mining and geology are still good books. But he writes another book called The Infinite, in which he starts to explore the creative power behind the physical world. He says, look, Mm -hmm. somebody made this place, and I want to write about that. What he wanted to know is how God created the world and how he relates to it now that it's been created. And in pursuit of that idea... He becomes fascinated with the idea of a human soul, this sort of neoplatonic concept that the universe is divided up into an imperfect material world and a perfect invisible spiritual world. Hmm. So this is where his scientific brilliance sort of starts to drift into religious speculation. Exactly, exactly. And there was a lot of that from his day forward. Um, But Swedenborg, reckoning that he could pretty much explain anything in the world using science, he begins to look for the seat of the human soul in the body. Where Mm. is, if there's a human soul, where do you find it? Where does it reside? Right? Where does the ghost reside in your body? So in 1736, he goes to the Netherlands again, and he has access to a microscope, Mm -hmm. which, as we mentioned a moment ago, was a pretty recent invention in those days. It was miraculous. They could see this entire, you know, this... This tiny little, little world. world that existed, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And he became convinced that he had identified what he called spiritus fluid mm. mixed into our human blood. Huh. What he saw, I don't know. I don't know what he saw, but he saw spiritus fluid, okay. and that was enough to make him happy. I found the soul, right? I just explained spiritual matters with physical science. Mm. But then in 1743, something really weird begins to happen. When he's 56 years old, Mm -hmm. he starts having dreams and visions about the spirit world. Hmm. And so uh, my hunch is he obsessed about this from the microscope all the way down to his 56th birthday. Mm -hmm. And if I remember right, I know that I I could be remembering it wrong. Maybe this wasn't Swedenborg. I have about an 80 percent certainty it was that his father died at one point, which made him a little more obsessed about the subject of death. Hmm. But by 56, he's having dreams and visions about the spirit world, and he claims that he visits heaven and hell in a vision, and he actually talks to the people who live there. Hmm. Now, that was enough for a lot of his scientific contemporaries, as you can imagine, to, uh, well, they were convinced his cheese had slid off the cracker. He, okay, <laughs> Swedenborg's lost it. You know, we're done with him. Yeah. But he was convincing enough to build a following with other people. Hmm. Well, if that was the case, and a church was eventually built around it, he wrote this stuff down, I yeah, presume? Yeah, absolutely. Shortly after the vision started, he began writing about what he considered was the true meaning of the Bible, the deeper meaning. Okay. What he basically said was, look, what you read in the Bible, the plain sense of the Scripture doesn't make any sense. If you read the Bible at face value, you're missing the point. Hmm. And to illustrate what he was saying, he referred back to his pursuit for the human soul. He said, look, the Bible is like a dead body without its spirit. Just reading the Bible is like a dead body. But if you have the spirit, you get to its deeper, more illuminated meaning. So he's saying just like a, you need a ghost inside of a body, that was his position. You need a ghost mm-hmm. inside of a body to make it alive. You have to have the deeper meaning to make the Bible alive or it's just a dead book. So this becomes a full-time obsession by 1747. He's petitioning the king to let him out of the Board of Mines so that he can become a theologian. Hmm. By 1749, he puts out his first theological work, uh, becomes a multi-volume set known as Arcana Celestia, or Secrets of Heaven. Hmm. 
It's kind of a verse-by-verse commentary on the whole Bible. He starts in Genesis. He never made it all the way through, but he starts in Genesis. And again, his big point is, don't take the Bible literally, but look for the deeper spiritual meaning behind it. Uh, and you need enlightenment from beyond in order to get to that. And hmm. to be honest, at first blush, what he writes seems to make a little bit of sense, at least in the first couple of paragraphs. I will give him the first two paragraphs of that book. I will give him. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It does make a little bit of sense. What a huge undertaking for him. In what way does it make a little okay. bit well, of sense? At the very beginning, he starts making reference to something that a modern theologian would call typology. Okay. saying the symbols mm-hmm. in the Old Testament clearly foreshadow Jesus in the New. So well, you can always truth. find foreshadowing of Jesus in the symbols and the rituals and even in the stories. And there is a sense uh, in which that is true. The Old Testament absolutely does anticipate the New Testament. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are some examples of well, Old Testament the typology? obvious ones would be The obvious ones would be like a lamb foreshadows Jesus and the right. sacrificial lambs. Right. Joseph, this favored son who's betrayed by his brethren and then he saves them in the end. That foreshadows Jesus. Yeah. Israel itself called out of, the, out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. Uh, Paul calls that a baptism. They spend 40 years in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. Jesus comes up out of Egypt. He crosses the Jordan River in his baptism and then spends 40 days in the wilderness. So mm-hmm. there are lots of types and symbols that do point forward to Jesus. Mm-hmm. So Swedenborg appears to build on something that really exists. Yeah, absolutely. In this case, at He least. starts out by using typology to make his case, right? He argues that we all recognize there's a deeper meaning in the Old Testament mm-hmm. when we deal with this symbolism. But then he says it runs deeper than we realize that every single word, every single concept stands for something different. And I was going to read, I was actually going to read from Arcana Celestia today, but forget it. You know, we won't have time and I really don't want to read aberrant theology on the air, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's (laughs) where we're at though. But um, it does, it does, he starts out by using something all theologians recognize and then he goes wackadoo. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So from this point forward, he starts to reveal what he considers to be the deeper, this deeper meaning that you described. And right. I'm guessing that's where he, you know, takes a sharp left turn from Orthodox Christianity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll read a little bit here. I'll okay. show you where he starts to argue that without understanding his special interior knowledge, mm-hmm. which is always a, f- uh, it's always a red flag that you're dealing with a cult. Someone, I have the secret knowledge and you don't, right? Yeah, that's true. Here's what he writes. Without this interior life, the word in its letter is dead. In other words, if you don't have a special knowledge, the Bible is meaningless. Hmm. It resembles a human being. And that a human has an outward self and an inward one, as the Christian world knows. Uh, he says, in the same way, the word regarded from a purely literal standpoint is a body without a soul. I hmm. made that point, but there it is in his own words. So okay. what he's doing is, is taking his obsession with explaining spiritual things, explaining the human soul, and he takes it and applies it to the Bible. But what he's really doing is taking pagan Greek philosophy philosophy and importing it into a decidedly Hebrew, Hebrew text. text yeah. right? And this yeah. is something we've done from time to time. The Gnostics did the same thing in North Africa, mm-hmm. Christians who imported Greek philosophy and came up with really weird spiritualistic ideas as a result. Uh, the Jews in Philo's time in Alexandria sort of played with the same thing. And um, in, in well, anyway, the Gnostics, the Gnostics went as far as to say that the reason there's pain and suffering in the world is because the Creator botched it. He blew the creation, and Jesus had to come and fix it, and Jesus oh, is showing us a higher... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but, of course, Swedenborg, not really a Gnostic. So, so where exactly is Swedenborg going? Well, he tells us that the literal language of the Bible is not the real meaning, and you got to have his special knowledge. Okay. Uh, now, to be fair, there's no question, if you're going to study the Bible, you don't want to just have a surface reading. He's right about yeah. that. I'll give him that. You do have to mine the scriptures for their riches, mm-hmm. and a surface understanding isn't enough. And it's also true that you will never truly understand the words of the Bible without the guidance of the author of the Bible, the Holy Spirit. That much is clear from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse mm. 14. It says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Sure. So it's true that if you really want to understand the Bible, you have to be receptive to the Spirit of God. You want to be guided by the author, which is why, you know, 
I don't know if you noticed those courses in the college catalog when you were a kid, but like the Bible is literature. Mm -hmm. And then you would go to this thing and they they would read the Bible and get nothing out of it other than its literary form. Mm -hmm. And you would meet these professors who could read the Bible and not be inspired by it, Mm -hmm. but... Well, I I experienced that personally in my Lit 12 class in high school. We had a whole chapter on the King King James Version of the Bible. Ah. It was purely academic, nothing spiritual. Mm -hmm. But they they read the same text, and they come away with nothing. They're not getting the same sense of inspiration and so on. And um, there you go. Yeah, And the Bible is a literature. You know, it's true. And I often wonder how some people can read the Bible and yet completely miss the point. Um, But then when you talk to them, you discover that they never really were interested in finding the point. They were just reading the Bible, oftentimes just to find fault with it. No, that's right. And so what are you going to get out of it at that point? So you do need the illumination of the Holy Spirit, but Swedenborg goes way beyond that. Mm. And perhaps the most troubling aspect of what he taught comes from the fact that he actually claimed to speak to the dead. Mm. here, what does he say here? In that world, he writes, I've been taught about the different kinds of spirits, the situation of souls after death, hell, or the regrettable state of the faithless, and heaven, or the blissful state of the faithful. He wow. says, man, I talked to these period. I kept company with spirits and angels. I heard them talking. I talked to them. I have been able to see and hear the most amazing things in the other life. Hmm. So he's admitting that his source of inspiration isn't just the guidance of the Holy Spirit as he's reading the Bible, but that he was speaking to the dead, which right. uh, that's that's a clear violation of what the Bible teaches. Exactly. So here he's claiming to get spiritual knowledge and deeper knowledge speaking to the dead, and the Bible forbids speaking to the dead, and right. it makes it crystal clear that the dead cannot speak to us. Um And it's particularly revealing that clearly non-biblical movements like the spiritualists of the 19th century and the Church of Christ scientists and other groups drew a great deal of inspiration from the writings of Emanuel Swedenborg to the point where some people have speculated that Mary Baker Eddy actually lifted her ideas right out of the works of Emanuel Swedenborg, Hmm. including, well, including the idea Emanuel Swedenborg taught that disease isn't real, it's just a product of a diseased mind. Interesting. There is no real disease. Yeah. So in reality, Swedenborg didn't just draw inspiration from Bible study, but also from something almost like a seance, which was also, of course, popular by the time we get to the 19th century. Yeah, that's a completely fair assessment. He probably didn't sit around the table summoning the spirits in the same sense that we had in the 19th century, Mm. but he was talking to spirits. And the conclusions he came to in his discussions with those spirits are really troubling because These spirits don't just add to the plain sense of Scripture. These spirits start to contradict what you find in the Bible. So, for example, he claimed that the spirits revealed to him that the writings of the Apostle Paul are wrong. And he starts to suggest Paul was on a massive ego trip and the other apostles in heaven won't hang out with Paul. That they're all up there and the other apostles won't hang out with Paul because they all hate Paul. That's what he was saying. I hear the music. We're going to have to come back to why Peter and John and James won't hang out with Paul in the spirit world. In theory. Yeah, in theory. That's not actually what we believe. That's a Swedenborgian thought. We're going to take a little break and we'll come back to why that's not true. They do like Paul. We'll be right back. Disclosure is just one of the programs brought to you by the Voice of Prophecy, like the audio adventure program, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a weekly Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy faith-building stories with Jake Donovan, (laughs) Mr. Simon, and others in this small mountain town. Each summer, campers visit Discovery Mountain, where they sing songs, learn about God, and reenact a Bible story with the help of drama teachers, Miss Wendy and Miss Tamara. With 24 full episodes every year and programming every week, your family will have something uplifting to listen to every week. Listen to episodes on demand and watch video features from director Doug at discoverymountain.com or on your favorite podcast platform. That's discoverymountain.com.
while we were on the break, we did not have communication with the spirit world. We just <laughs> didn't. No. No. Um, we're talking about Emanuel Swedenborg and some of the biblical problems with this very influential man. I know you've never heard of him out there, um, but you'll be surprised when you study it just how far-reaching his influence was. You know, I, I I had heard of him in the connection with Johnny Appleseed. That's the one place for whatever reason oh. Well, we haven't I, gotten I to that part of the show. I was going to surprise he, people oh, with that. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay, but it's true. Johnny Appleseed, John Chapman was a Swedenborgian yeah, that's, disciple. Yeah, that's the only time I ever really knew about about this, and wow, it's much more far-reaching yeah. than I realized. Yeah, and, and it's it, it, it runs deep. This mm-hmm. goes far. This gives birth to a lot of the spiritualistic influences in America in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And just before the break, we're saying, look, he he goes beyond saying that he has spiritual insight that gets him to the deeper meaning of the Bible. He visits the spirit world, and the people in heaven are contradicting what's actually in the Bible Mm -hmm. to the point where he claims he meets the other apostles, and they don't want to hang out with Paul. I'm I'm putting it in modern vernacular. We don't like Paul. We We can reject all of Paul's writing. So he rejects. Wow. A, a yeah. whole swath of the New Testament that, would be a, rejected then that, if he rejects Paul's writings. Right. He actually takes issue with the idea that you are justified by faith alone. Hmm. And, of course, Paul spends a lot of that of yeah, time Romans. discussing that in the book of Romans. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Swedenborg doesn't like that. So the easy solution for him is let's discount the author of the book of Romans. Hmm. So you say there's a, there's a church group now that follows his teachings. Right. Do they include Paul's letters in their well, Bible? Yeah, they do. But what Swedenborg taught is that they were mostly just Paul's misguided opinion oh. and that they don't, those letters don't have the extra layer of deeper meaning oh, in them. Okay, okay. Right? So they still have them. Interesting reading, historical reading, but mm-hmm. they're not inspired, they say, like the rest of the Bible. Okay, interesting. So Swedenborg suggested that he visited the spirit, spirit world. So would that mean that he believes he visited heaven and hell? Yeah, he, he says he did. And here's where he clearly departs from Orthodox Christianity. Okay. He suggests that heaven and hell, to some extent, are just a state of mind. Hmm. And so, I mean, when you just listen to that, things are a state of mind. You hear that idea pop up again in the 19th century with some of the new religious ideas that were circulating in America. Everything's just in your mind. It goes right down to the positive thinking movements of the early 20th century. A lot of these things are just in your head. Mm -hmm. And he claimed that people who cling to wickedness go into the afterlife with the same tendencies in their brain, and they just create their own hell. Their Mm. bad thinking is creating hell for them, and people who purify their thoughts end up in heaven because they go into the afterlife with good thoughts. Okay. Well, and of course, that runs contrary to what the Bible teaches, because it teaches that nobody is in hell right now, that according to Scripture, judgment by fire is still in the future. So how in the world could Swedenborg visit them? No, that's right. That's right. If you read the parable in... No, no, we're going to surprise a lot of Christians. I'd encourage you, like, get online, go to VOP.com, get the little book that we've got there called... um draining the sticks and where we separate what the Bible says Mm -hmm. and maybe where some other influences have come into our modern thinking. But if you read the parable of the end of the world that Jesus teaches in Matthew 13, the wheat and the tares, Jesus says the fire happens at the harvest at the the end end of the world. It's in Matthew 13, verse 40. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. So there's no way he can visit people in torment, not according to the words of Jesus. Okay. So the Bible's teaching is that no one suffers the punishment of fire until the second coming. Correct. It does teach that. Right, right. So that would put it after the judgment, of course, um, which makes sense. So this eliminates the possibility that Swedenborg was actually visiting people in hell. That's right. Yeah. Now, Sean, a moment ago, you said that speaking to the dead was prohibited by the Bible. You touched on that, which means that Swedenborg was doing something that really isn't biblically possible. Yeah, not possible or permissible. But let's mm-hmm. get it from, take a look at Job chapter 7 and verse 9. Okay. It says, as the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house. So the dead don't come back and haunt their house. They don't Mm -hmm. come to seances. God says that doesn't happen. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Uh, Nevermore, verse 6, do they have anything, any share in anything done under the sun? So they don't participate in our lives. The dead don't come back and communicate with us. Mm. They don't. Mm -hmm. Um, In Isaiah, we find specific instructions that we are supposed to ignore people who consult the dead, which means you can just toss Emanuel Swedenborg's books aside. Hmm. Isaiah 8, verse 19, when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter. That's the style of the medium back in those days. Mm -hmm. They would mutter, mutter, mutter and communicate with the spirit world. God says in that passage, Isaiah 8, 19, 
Should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, God compares the the advice you get from a spirit medium, someone claims to talk to the dead, and says, why would you go to that? If they disagree, if they speak not according to this word, to the law and to the testimony, then there's no light in them. If they disagree with the Bible, and it goes on and on. Deuteronomy has passages where God actually condemned spirit mediums to death. Mm -hmm. Um, They were cut off from God's people, removed in Leviticus 20. If you're communicating with the dead, that is a direct violation of God's will. Mm -hmm. It is not permissible, and God says it is also not possible. Hmm. Well, it's pretty clear from the verses you just shared in Job, Ecclesiastes, and Isaiah. Yeah. Um, so Swedenborg was engaging in a practice that was clearly forbidden. In yes, the it Bible. is completely forbidden. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, and I think that should give a lot of comfort to people, really, too, to know that um, this isn't happening. This is no. You're being God's hoodwinked. Plan. Let me just say yeah. this: the people who claim, like, what the guy on TV crossing over, whatever, they're mm-hmm. lying. They're lying to yeah. you. It's not biblically possible. If you are a Christian, run. Run away from this stuff. It can't happen. Yeah. There might be a spiritualistic influence talking to that medium, but it is not the spirits of the dead, according to the Bible. Mm-hmm. Run. Yeah, they play on the emotions that, yeah, they we, do. that we feel of, of missing our loved ones. Yeah, they yeah. do. Yeah. So going back to Swedenborg, he was engaging in a practice that was clearly forbidden in yep. the Bible. And yep. to make things even <laughs> more fishy, he insisted that the spirits were giving him information that helped him move past the plain meaning of Scripture to some sort of that secret, hidden, deep. Yeah. Knowledge. Yeah. Um, but I suppose that someone might bring up the case of Saul and the witch of Endor, right? Where the Bible shows him communicating with the ghost of Samuel. How, what yeah. do you make of that? I think you should read that in its context and read it in its entirety. Let's take a look at that. First okay. Samuel 8, 28. We don't have the time to read all the way through this, but let me highlight a few things in that story. Um, in verse 3 of First Samuel 28, it tells us Samuel died, so the great prophet in Israel is gone. Israel lamented for him, and Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land, it tells us. Now, why would he do that? Yeah, It's because God had forbidden it, and mm-hmm. Saul was godly in the beginning, mm-hmm. and he does what he's told. He gets rid of the spiritists, right? They're not allowed to communicate with the dead. Verse 4, then the Philistines gathered together and came and camped at Shunem. So here's what's going on in this story. Um, now there's a war going on, and Samuel's not around to give advice. Right, Samuel and, the prophet. Yeah, and mm-hmm. Saul is desperate because he's trying to communicate with the Lord, the story tells us in verse 6, and God doesn't answer him because he's disobedient and mm. wicked. Mm-hmm. God's not communicating with Saul. He becomes so disobedient, and at this point in the story, Saul is a lost man. Mm-hmm. Right? This is the reason he's about to go to a spirit medium, because he's desperate for advice and God's not talking to him. Okay. So let's ask this question. Right? Since the death of Saul... God refused to, or since the death of Samuel, Samuel. rather, yeah, God refused to send another prophet. He will not communicate with this wicked king, um, and he's not communicating through his divinely appointed channels. There's Mm -hmm. no prophet. So you have to wonder, at that case, if wicked Saul at this point does something forbidden instead, okay, I'm going to go to a spirit medium, is God now obliged to start talking to him because he's doing something forbidden? No. No, it doesn't make sense. He mm-hmm. didn't find some tricky loophole where, Mm-mm. oh, I'm going to get advice out of God. I'll go to the spirit medium. He'll have to cooperate. Not at all. No, not likely. Verse 7. Then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at? Endor. Endor. Notice something fishy about that name. Remember at the end of Star Wars, they visit a planet uh, of the Ewoks. What's the name of the planet the Ewoks live on? I don't remember. It's Endor. Is it? It is Endor. And what huh. happens at the end of that? Obi-Wan Kenobi shows up. His ghost shows up at the end. And he's dressed like he's the prophet character in there. Hmm. There's no question no that George accident. Lucas is channeling <laughs> this story, if you pardon the pun. He's channeling <laughs> this story of Saul and the Witch of Endor. Interesting. So it says in verse 8 that Saul disguises himself. Why does he have to disguise himself? He's about to do something wrong. He, that he knows is wrong. Right. Yeah. So he goes and he says, please conduct a seance for me and bring up the one I shall name to you. Mm-hmm. Bring him where? Bring him up. Up. He's not in heaven, right? Then you bring him up. Mm-hmm. Again, completely forbidden by Scripture. And uh, and it's not like God is going to say, oh, look how hard Saul's trying now. I guess I'll play along and I'll I'll send Samuel. No, n- no, no. And, and it only makes sense. If the dead cannot communicate with us, which is obviously taught in the Scripture, and I think we've right. gone through that, then if someone does communicate with you, then you have to ask the question, what is that? Yeah. Who is it, right? Yeah. 
And you'll notice the Bible doesn't say seances don't work. Right. They obviously do. Something happens or people wouldn't bother with them. But it's not the spirits of the dead you're talking to. And if it's not, then who are you talking to? And we have to remember that fallen angels are more than happy to help us wander away from God. There is something happening in this story, but it's demonic. Mm. right? Verse 9, the woman says, look, you know what Saul has done. Why do you lay a snare for my life? And Saul swears, look, uh, as the Lord lives, I will never punish you for doing this thing. Nothing will ever happen to you. He's swearing by God's name that he won't punish this woman for conducting a seance. He's getting twisted here. (laughs) Verse 11, the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? Hmm. Bring Samuel up for me. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting yeah. that she's bringing him up, up. instead of down well, from heaven. Yeah, they all live in the shadowy underworld in her way of thinking. She's spiritualistic, and you can talk to the dead, and they're all beneath your feet. Right. When the woman saw Samuel, verse 12, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Now, hmm. who sees Samuel in this vision? Who sees him? She does. She does. Saul mm-hmm. doesn't. True. She sees something. And in the king, yeah, verse 13, Mm -hmm. king says, what do you see? Mm -hmm. And she says, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth, not coming down from heaven, ascending out of the earth. True. What form? The old man is coming up covered with a mantle. In verse 14, it says, Saul perceived it was Samuel. Ah. So she sees this apparition. Right. He asks questions. What do you see? What do you see? She describes it and he goes, oh, Oh, that must be Samuel. Yeah, he he applies what he's thinking to it. And Mm -hmm. only at this point in the story is the apparition actually referred to by the name Samuel. Samuel. Right? Here. The Bible goes out of the way to point out that Saul believes it's Samuel. The spirit medium tells him. And Samuel says to Saul, why do you disturb me for bringing me up? What's interesting, if you read the whole story, what happens is he falls down and bows before this apparition. And if you compare that to what happens in the book of Revelation, when an angel appears to John and John bows down, the angel says, what are you you doing? Mm -hmm. Get up off of your knees. I'm Mm -hmm. just a fellow human being like you. But this Mm -hmm. apparition accepts it. Saul prostrates prostrates himself. (laughs) Saul could prostrate himself. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you prostrate Prostrate. yourself. (laughs) Yeah, he prostrates himself. Mm -hmm. And this being takes it. And at the end of the story, verse 19, it says, well... um, Here is verse 19. Moreover, the Lord also will deliver Israel with you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with With me. me. So what happens here? He perceives that the apparition the woman sees in a forbidden ritual is Samuel. Only when he decides it's Samuel does the story call him Samuel. He Hmm. bows down and scrapes before it. This being takes it. And before it's over, uh, Samuel knows he's going to be dead by tomorrow. Does that sound like God at work, yes or no? No, it does not. No, no. He's doing something forbidden. You can't talk to the dead. And I'm glad you brought that question up. We do need to get back to Emmanuel Swedenborg. But the fact is, the Bible forbids communication with the dead. What Emmanuel Swedenborg was doing was just as forbidden as what Saul was doing. Mm -hmm. And so it is not of God. We can be clear about that. It is not of God. You cannot talk to the dead. So I hear the music playing. That means we've only got, what, one segment left? One segment left. All right. I think we're going to be surprised at how big this guy's influence was. We're going to be right back. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions? Like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Does my life really matter to God? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers that you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers in guides like A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter the most to you. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. The Strange Case of Emanuel Swedenborg. We are in segment number four. Yes. Can you believe it? Again, we're out of time because you talked so much. Oh, yeah. 
constantly. You're totally chatter, the chatter, chatty. Chatter. You're the chatty one in our marriage. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah, unless no, there are situations where you tell stories with far more detail than I do. If it's anything to do with the kids, yeah, or what happened at school today for one of our kids, <laughs> that story is very detailed. I always want to know details when you go on a trip and you see people maybe that I haven't seen for a long time, and you just never know enough information. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> like you need to give me a list of questions to ask. It's like so. How's that thing with his wart on his knee? I don't know. I didn't ask him about that. Like, you always come up with something that I... No, it's really basic stuff like, where are their kids now? And did they get married? Basic stuff. But I don't know. You guys How's he dealing with his wife's death? We didn't talk about it. <laughs> That's usually your answer. I don't know. We didn't talk about it. No, we didn't. All right. Swedenborg. 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 Let's get back to Swedenborg. Yeah. yeah. It's... Um, there's no question. There's no question that Swedenborg pulled off some amazing feats. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's some things there that are hard to explain, including mm-hmm. one night he let it, he let people he was at a dinner party and he lets everybody know that the spirit world just told him there was a fire 250 miles away and that it was going to stop it was stopping just doors down from his house. Really, turns out he's accurate, right? Mm-hmm. And in the days before instantaneous communication, that was pretty miraculous. Right. He wasn't getting a te- yeah. text message. But the Bible mm-hmm. warns us specifically, you can't take prophets at face value, even if they get a few predictions right. They That's have to true. be in compliance with the Bible. Uh, for example, Deuteronomy 13. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or wonder, in other words, he pulls off something miraculous, mm-hmm. and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke, saying, let us go after you gods, other gods, verse 3, you shall not listen to him. Mm-hmm. So if he disagrees with Scripture, you can reject him out of hand, and Swedenborg disappears with Scripture. So Disagrees, rather, not disappears. <laughs> well, actually, his teachings disappear in the light of Scripture, too. Oh, that's accurate. Yeah. So he may have had dreams and visions. I'll give him that. Mm-hmm. They are not a substitute for the Word of God. When it comes down to it, the whole essence of what Swedenborg was doing was placing his dreams and visions above the Scripture, which led to some really erroneous teachings. Uh, he denies the inspiration of the writings of Paul. We touched on that. Huge part of the New Testament. Right? He mm-hmm. denies the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. He denies justification by faith. Mm-hmm. He teaches that the second coming already happened, but it happened in the spiritual realm in 1757 in his unseen world. Okay. Uh, he says that the descent of the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation was actually the establishment of his new church. The why it's called the Church of the New Jerusalem. Oh, Okay. Right. He denies the physical resurrection of the dead, even though the Bible's very clear on that. He just says, look, when you die, you cast your body aside, you never get another one. Hmm. Right. Disposable. He taught that people become angels, uh, which is not at all what the Bible teaches. Hmm. Yeah. We should talk some more about angels. It's fascinating. We, who knows? Maybe we'll do a whole show on angels. <laughs> we who should knows? do a whole yeah. show on angels. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, the Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, it creates a huge distinction between humans and angels. Yeah, and, it does. Uh, Psalm 8, verse 5 teaches that we were made a little lower than the angels. Correct. Yeah, and it says in Job, it says in Job 38 um, that the angels, the morning stars, the sons of God, sang for joy at creation. So, uh, you know, I think that means that the angels were already there when the human race was created. Correct. We don't become angels when we die. That's popular in movies. It's popular in Victorian stories. Yeah. Um, but it's not in the Bible anywhere. We don't become angels when we die. And Swedenborg was teaching we do become angels when we die. It's not found in Scripture. The angels were there before us. They're made of a different order. Um, in Swedenborg even taught that we kind of continue on with our marriages in heaven, but hmm. Jesus taught that angels don't have marriages. So how can we be the it angels? Right? Up, yeah, Matthew right? 22. Right. Uh, Swedenborg's ideas about the secret meaning of the Bible and his strange ideas about the afterlife really basically disqualify his teachings and mean that you and I as Christians should just avoid him altogether. Okay. It should be a giant red flag when so-called spirits contradict the plain teachings of the Bible. Absolutely. This is not biblical Christianity. Hmm. And that's why John Wesley warned his congregation against reading Swedenborg in 1770. Hmm. Here's what he said. This is John Wesley. Of the most ingenuous, lively, entertaining madmen that ever set pen to paper, his, Emanuel Swedenborg's, waking dreams are so wild that one might as easily swallow the stories of Tom Thumb or Jack the Giant Killer. Hmm. That's that's Clearly stories. yeah. But he's, he notice he's he's admitting that Swedenborg's kind of brilliant. Yeah, and yeah. he was brilliant. Entertaining madman. That's a good description. Yeah, he's a lively, ingenious, entertaining madman. Mm-hmm. He was a genius, no question about it. 
but he's also a false teacher. As far as Christian theology goes, he was a false teacher. And he was also very influential, you said, wasn't he? Yeah, mind-bogglingly so. Um, Who did he influence? Well, a a, a lot of people. Most people listening today are going to go, who? And who's Emanuel Swedenborg? Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe it'll kind of ring a bell, but you won't know who he is. When you start to dig around in this story, you make some pretty astonishing discoveries. Okay. His influence is huge. William Blake. Oh, the poet. The poet. Hmm. Now, William Blake also was involved in the big debates in the 1700s about, 16 and 1700s, about whether or not it was okay to get rid of monarchs. And that was one of the big debates Hmm. that actually led to the birth of the American Constitution. I'm letting in on a little series (laughs) that I'm working on. But William Blake... Uh, The poet, completely influenced by Swedenborg. You'll find Swedenborg ideas in his poems. Interesting. To a lesser degree, William Butler Yeats. Oh, Yeats. I know. You sound disappointed. Him, too? Yeah. Yeah, there are some (laughs) ideas there, right? And we actually, we we had the chance to go. We saw his grave. We went and visited his grave. grave, And we did not communicate with the dead there. We just wanted to see his headstone. We saw the pretty church and and, and where he's buried. Where was that? That was in. That was um, the place right, right after where the tire. Where, where, where our tire blew tire. out, we blew out a tire. Where was that? In the Sligo, 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 Ireland, Sligo, beautiful Ireland. beach town. William Butler Yeats. His poetry is mm-hmm. good, but clearly influenced by Emanuel Swedenborg. Oh, that's too bad. Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Hmm, another good one. Right, and yeah. I quote from Elizabeth Barrett Browning: "To my mind, the only light that has been cast on the other life is found in Swedenborg's philosophy. Hmm. It explains much that was incomprehensible." Oh. That's disappointing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, no, you know, her literature is good. The re- this influence is huge. Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Really? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Here's what he said. I can venture to assert that as a moralist, Swedenborg is above all praise. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. And that as a naturalist, psychologist, and theologian, he has strong and varied claims on the gratitude and admiration of the professional in philosophical faculties. Wow. So that's kind of a part part endorsement yeah but yeah. he's recommended so gives him some praise yeah you ready mm-hmm. for another one i don't know <laughs> yeah here we go helen keller oh really yep right born blind yes. mute right yes. big hero really she was a huge admirer huh. and i quote she was reading swedenborg he'd been translated into braille at one point oh, his okay. his writings were so widely spread um i'd been told by narrow people that all who were not Christians would be punished, and naturally my soul revolted, since I knew of wonderful men who had lived and died for truth as they saw it in the pagan lands. So she's starting to lean towards Jesus is not the only way to heaven. Yeah. That'd make another show. Um, God is trying to save everybody, and, and there's something. Anyway, here's what she says. She continues, reading Swedenborg in Braille. But in Heaven and Hell, a book by Emmanuel Swedenborg, in Heaven and Hell, I found that Jesus stands for divine good, good wrought into deeds, and Christ divine truth, sending forth new thought. We should probably underline that word because new thought um, is a, a concept that shows up a lot when we get into the 20th century yeah. and we have Norman Vincent Peale and It'd be uh, interesting Dale to Carnegie. Those dots, well, they're li- literally teaching something called new thought, and you can trace it back to Swedenborg. But she says, sending forth new thought, new life, and joy into the minds of men. Therefore, no one who believes in God and lives right is ever condemned. Hmm. So, I grew to womanhood, Helen Keller writes. I took more and more to the new church doctrines. It's not just called the Church of the New Jerusalem. They also called it the New Church. I took more and more to the new church doctrines as my religion. Hmm. No one encouraged me in this choice. And I cannot explain it any more than anyone else. I can only say that the word of God, freed from the blots and stains of barbarous creeds, has been at once the joy and good of my life. In other words, once you get past what it says on the surface and get to Swedenborg's interpretation, the Bible is good. Here's what she says. Swedenborg was an eye among the blind, an ear among the deaf, one of the noblest champions true Christianity has ever known. (laughs) Helen Keller. Wow, she really esteemed him highly. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Huge. And then, the, then here, here comes one that you already, you you, uh, you gave it Yeah, away. this was the only connection that I was aware of right. prior to our John show Chapman. program today. John right, we know John e. Chapman Appleseed. from the Disney cartoons, right? He's, he's <laughs> right. Johnny Appleseed, and he traveled all over America planting apple trees everywhere. True, mm-hmm. he did. You know what else he planted? Swedenborg books. He carried them with him everywhere he went, and he loaned them to families so that they would read them. And he was a Swedenborg missionary, John yeah. Chapman. 
Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes? No big surprise here. You find a lot of spiritualism in his writings. Yeah. I will read to you from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Are you okay. ready? Here we go. I'm ready. The great Swedish seer. Seer should give everything away. Mm, uh, the great Swedish seer, Emanuel Swedenborg, has some claim to be the father of our new knowledge of supernal matters. Hmm. When the first rays of the rising sun of spiritual knowledge fell upon the earth, they illuminated the greatest and highest human mind before they shed their light on lesser men. That mountain peak of mentality was this great religious reformer and clairvoyant medium. You know, how do you wow. how do you claim? That's Sir Arthur Conan Doyle on Swedenborg. He said, you know, God had to talk to him first before the rest of us mere mortal dummies mm -hmm. could understand what the Bible teaches. And meanwhile, the Bible teaches that there is no teaching in the Bible that is of secret knowledge, that we can all understand that, right? Yeah. Of no private interpretation. That's the way Peter phrases it. Robert Frost. Another poet. Yeah, I know. All the poets and authors. I've ruined your whole <laughs> yes, library. No. Here's the good news. Robert Frost left the Swedenborg Church. Well, that's good. Yeah, so he changed his mind. But before that, here's what he said. Okay. Robert Frost. What is my philosophy? That is hard to say. I was brought up a Swedenborgian, so he was raised in the church. All right. I am not a Swedenborgian now. There's the good news. But there is a good deal of it that's left with me. I'm a mystic. I believe in symbols. I believe in change and in changing symbols. Yet that does not take me away from the kindly contact of human beings. No, it brings me closer to them. Hmm. Robert Frost. Here's a big one. Carl Jung, hmm. the Swiss the psychologist, psychologist. Right? Hugely influential. This is what I mean by saying yeah. that Swedenborg is more influential than we realize because the people he influenced are some of the biggest influencers in our world Certainly. today. Right? He wrote, Carl Jung said, I admire Swedenborg as a great scientist. So do I. I'll give him that. And a great mystic at the same time. I hmm. don't give him that. His life and work has always been of great interest to me, and I read about seven fat volumes of his writings when I was a medical student. Swedenborg was a seer of unparalleled profundity, a scholar with superior intelligence. Hmm. And it goes on and no. on and on. There Calvin, are more? President Calvin Coolidge really? praised him. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said. Now that's getting a little closer yeah, to our time. I know, time. I know. FDR said, in a world in which the voice of conscience seems too often silent and weak, is need for spiritual leadership of which Swedenborg is a particular example. <laughs> Wow. And it goes on. I've got a list of names as long as my arm. But here, okay. here's what it boils down to. This guy's hugely influential, and you can trace from his writing straight to the spiritualistic movements of the 19th century. We'll do a program on that here at some point. But if you've been tempted to read Swedenborg or you've been reading it, you should know that he contradicts Scripture. He does not illuminate it. He contradicts it. I do believe God speaks to people on occasion and gives them great insight. But if that insight contradicts the Bible, God is not the author of that insight. And in this case, my Bible is crystal clear. Yeah. Swedenborg did not communicate with the dead. It is not possible or permissible according to the Word of God. And we can understand the Bible, and we can understand its richness and its depth yeah. without any secret right. messages. He started right. He started right. You do need to mine the scriptures for their riches, mm -hmm. and you need to pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But if it begins in a seance or ends in a seance, you're way off base. I say to people, check your influences. Don't take what people say as the gospel truth. You take what the Word of God says as the gospel truth. It's Amen. the only safe place to stand. We're at the end of the show. Swedenborg used up all of our time, but there and you I, go. I believe you've greatly educated many of our listeners, There you Sean. go. I hope fascinating. so. fascinating. Well, I hope it was fascinating. I try. I try to please. <laughs> all right. We're out of time. Until next time, I'm Sean Boonstra, and this has been Disclosure. <laughs>